what is it that makes us come out in that second half and have the energy that we do? Because for most teams, it's you start off with the energy and it drops off, whereas we seem to have the opposite problem. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it's the op it, even as, as a problem or how you frame it. It's more as like how we're going to control the first part of the game so that we're in a position to come out and have a go in a later part of the game that if we... You know, do we start like that and then you can't sustain it and you're opened up in the second half or your legs are gone and, the, and then, you know, that's where you'll see, like, Leanne comes off the bench and she gives us a, 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 a good run option and then you try to affect the changes like that. But, yeah, the girls were, uh, you know, really energetic, really aggressive. We see Caitlin came much more into it and she's, you know, we're saying to her, you're much more when you're, you're really on it instead of being passive in that defensive phase and go on be brave and push Aoife up and you engage a bit higher so I think that's what we did in the second half and yeah we had a few chances there that you think oh why go on it's gonna but it doesn't happen but yeah we're learning all the time and uh, yeah we're learning against the best in the world. <laughs> yeah it's Silent Gleeson um, uh, in a fairly pragmatic mood in the aftermath of the 2-0 defeat last night. Um, Mifta Burkett good morning to you how are you? Good, yeah, all good now. Do you what? What's your sense today with the two games now back to back? Um, that are you positive about what what the experience has been like, or uh, are we realistic? Uh, are we being a bit too soft on them if we don't actually hold them to account? What's your? I think um, I think relatively positive. Yeah, from based off particularly last night's performance was a bit more improved than it, than it had been against the French. That the French uh, game, I don't think we saw much of the ball at all in, in the other half of the, of the field but they kind of at times they went toe to toe you could say a little bit with England but you know particularly lately in the last 15 minutes I think we um, they were a little bit at sixes and sevens at the back but um, ultimately I mean we didn't get a goal even over the two games but then again we were playing against second and third in the world so you can't get much higher Yeah so these are two very good teams um, like there's there's definitely a glass half full and there's definitely a glass half empty. England missed a penalty. Um, they had a couple of great chances that uh, you know if, if one doesn't go straight at Courtney Brosnan, it could have been four or five. But equally, it could have been four or five and it wasn't. And we dug in and created some chances towards the end of the game. Um, what's the difference between uh, this current setup and what we would have been seeing under Vera Pau? Um, structure wise I don't think there's actually a whole, whole lot of difference I think maybe just that we've built off the experiences in the World Cup and you know we're a little bit braver now when we have the ball or just maybe even just have that bit more quality and um, it's very much 5-4-1 um, still and it was last night and um, you know we the, the wing backs weren't really wing they were more back so it was like um, yeah qu quite similar with regard to the structure but um, but at the same time it just feels like we've progressed um Hard to put your finger on it exactly how, but I think that even just in terms of decision making on the ball and just progression up the pitch, I think is definitely well from Friday till to last night has improved anyway, and I think from overall from um, Vera's time till now there is has definitely been an improvement. I think Maeve's right in a lot of that. The only thing I would say is maybe a slight difference from the Vera tenure is I think Eileen Gleason pulls the trigger on substitutions and changes up the game and the formation a lot quicker than Vera did, particularly in the World Cup. It was a massive source of frustration that sometimes the substitutions were coming maybe the last 15, 10, 15 minutes, which isn't yeah. when we need them. Whereas Eileen, as we've seen in the last two games, she hauled two players off at halftime because she wanted to change things. The rest of the substitutions came around the 60th minute. She's not afraid to change things up a little bit quicker. And I think those were the difference last night, those players coming on. Now, maybe we should have started with some of those players on the pitch and that's something we need to look at. But I do think that in-game management from her and her team is slightly better. Should we have started with Megan Connolly? I think there was rumours that maybe she had a niggle and um, right. yeah, and that. So I'm not I'm not sure if, if that was um, an option or not. But um, and I think Rusha came off uh, due to her Achilles injury as well. So um, yeah, I thought I thought Megan did well in the second half. Definitely that she kind of brought a bit of composure into the midfield. Is it to Kathleen's point? Is it uh, a sign that uh, Gleeson believes in her players a bit more than Vera Pau? She's willing to make those changes when she needs to, um, and and trust them on the ball a bit more maybe than Vera. Yeah, and I think, well, as well, maybe, you know, it's not always the same. Like, uh, it was very much a set 11, and we knew nearly the subs that were going to come on. There was really only about 13 players who featured a lot. 
um, in those times. But I think now, based off the opposition that we're playing, or you know the the kind of tactics or the the way we want to approach a game, then. Um, I think Eileen, like like Kathleen said, isn't afraid to mix it up, and you know she has tried four at the back, um, which previously didn't didn't work maybe that well. Um, you know, did a little bit of times against Italy when we played in the friendly, and then obviously Wales, she wasn't afraid to change it up as well. So I think it's there's a lot you can see kind of the team is developing as well as the management all the time. When it comes to those two changes, then that were made from the France game to last night, it wasn't just making Connolly; it was obviously Emily Murphy, so uh, Rusha and. Lucy Quinn come in for the two of them. Uh, why did she make those changes first off? Um, I think, well, maybe maybe it could have been enforced. I'm not sure, with, just due to may, maybe Megan um, been carrying something. But yeah. I thought that maybe the, the reasoning behind Lucy Quinn starting might have been to try make our transition from attack to defence a bit more seamless. But we didn't seem to utilise her in that way. Um, I thought she, at times, yeah, we just didn't didn't find her maybe with the passes. Um, one time in particular, I think Katie was breaking free and, and Lucy had made a great run, but we just couldn't connect the passes. And um, I think it just, yeah, it didn't work out in terms of the effectiveness, I think, of it. But And, um, you know, Rusha has had has has been playing well as well. So I think she was probably deserving of her starting chance. I don't think maybe she had the best half, half she's played and, and she was unfortunate, you know, with the penalty as well to concede that. But um, overall, I think, yeah, I think she's, just yeah, like I said, Eileen is just trying trying different things at different times. I was really surprised when Emily Murphy started against France. I think she's just come into the Irish setup. She's still playing at a collegiate level, which Heather Payne was too until this season. But I think when we were starting Emily or sorry, when we were starting Heather Payne, we had a lot less experienced options. And I do understand putting players like Emily Murphy in so she gets that experience at a high level. But I just thought she looked really at sea in the France game. And that was proven by the fact that she was pulled at halftime. And I think we do have the more experienced midfielders there that earned maybe more of a start against England. And I think that's why I was actually even surprised that Emily Murphy did come on towards the end because again I thought she looked a little bit lost at the quality of opposition that we were playing and maybe needs a little bit more time and experience to bet into the squad uh, even the level that she's playing at in collegiate level I think is slightly different to the one slightly lower to what Heather Payne was playing at so I I assume Eileen Gleeson is seeing something in training sessions and that's why she's willing to put her in there and has a lot of faith. And from what I've heard from players who watched her in Chelsea's academy, there is a talent there. I just don't know if she's at the level that we should be starting her in these big games at the moment. If everybody is fully fit, Kathleen was making the point earlier on that maybe Megan Campbell isn't 100% at the moment. So if everybody's fit, everybody's available for the Sweden games, you starting Campbell? I would personally, yeah. I mean, I think I know we, we go on about the long throw and it, it is it was last night our most effective at, attacking weapon, I thought. But at the same time, she brings a lot more to the game as well and that she's a lot of aggression. And I think she's really good on the ball as well and just provides that kind of balance with the, the left foot, obviously, on that on that side. And yeah, it does release Katie, like, like we were all calling out for, out for um, to be playing in a higher position too. So yeah, personally, I think if, if Megan, I think now that she's she's changed clubs to London City Lionesses, I think she'll be able to get a lot more game time there. And then hopefully then that will mean that that come when the games come around, um, the Sweden games, that she'll be in a position to start. Because it did seem that maybe last week that the, the long throw-in was an amazing tactical weapon, that it didn't make a whole pile of sense introducing uh, her halfway through the game, essentially. But at the same time, that's <clears throat> kind of using the uh, long throw and as a stick to beat Eileen Gleeson with. It's just so, it's something that she just happens to have. And I guess you got to analyse it in every other way. Does it increase her chances, though, starting? Does it like Is it something that you can actually build somebody or tactical approach around? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Like, it, like it's, it's very hard to defend against just because teams aren't used to defending it. Um, you can't practice it in training because other people can't throw it in and just the trajectory it comes in at it's angled towards the goal like a lot like some of you know her a lot of the throw-ins will end up in the goal if, if they're not touched but um which can't be said um about corners usually unless you're Katie taking one in the World Cup but um you know it is it's a it's a very unique weapon to have and I think yeah it definitely increases um her chances of, of being in the starting team but um yeah like I said she does bring a lot of other qualities too 
I think for the Sweden games, it's going to be really important as well that we can find a way to get Denise involved in more of the game. She was really frustrated when I spoke to her post-game last night at how little of the ball she had seen and talked about how much it psychologically had affected her as well. The last the short turnaround between the Friday to the uh, Tuesday in terms of it just being two really intense games, not having a lot of the ball. Even though you would say Ireland probably did have more of the ball last night, she was totally marked out of the game, which is something we saw happen to her in the World Cup too. So for you, Maeve, how do we make sure that we're utilising her? Yeah, it was difficult kind of nearly to watch because she she was she didn't have the impact on the game, I think, that she would have liked. But I think that comes down to, to probably, you know, England's tactics too and um, their midfield is stacked. And I think when we're playing that, flat four we only have two centre midfielders and um, it's, it's difficult because we're outnumbered for the whole game against England's three centre mids so you know we're, we're trying to provide the extra cover at the back with a third centre back but then we don't have that in midfield so we're just chasing the game and we're never going to be able to dominate I thought Kier Walsh I thought was the best player on the pitch she just like dictated play there from the whole mid spot Do you think I've had this argument with so many people since last night. So in the Sweden game, Kira Walsh was totally marked out of the game and Serena Wiegmann mentioned it afterwards that it's something that England haven't been able to deal with. I I said it last night on the evening show, but I don't think, yes, that's a very obvious tactic for us to pursue, but I don't think we have the players at the moment to pursue putting, say, two on Kira Walsh or making sure like you totally commit someone like Denise, or I know Katie was pretty tied up between Jess Park, <laughs> Lucy Bronze, and uh, Lauren James at different points. But do you think we have the quality that we could have commissioned someone to Kira Walsh, taken her out of the game, or would we have just been unraveled somewhere else? Yeah, exactly. I think exactly what you said. I think, you know, if we focus on one of their players, then um, like Walsh in this in this case, then we're just going to leave ourselves open elsewhere because they just sort of stacked the quality uh, all over the pitch. But... Um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to know, but I think you know when we have the five at the back. It's it is quite conservative, extra numbers at the back. But like I said, then it's hard then to impact the game further up the pitch when we are, um, particularly in that centre mid spot, which is really is kind of the engine room, obviously of of the game, and that's where a lot of the the battles are won and lost. And particularly possession wise, it's very hard to establish any kind of possession when you're outnumbered in that area. So what's the solution to that? That's the thing. Who knows? It's like, do we change it and do we just you know try to? I think play more narrow I think even like a diamond formation maybe in midfield and let our full backs you know or sorry our wing backs try to you know at least um, obviously they will take the, the the winger but then if we can come across like just make the pitch narrow and then if we're if we are playing in a diamond formation or a box formation in midfield then just come across to the side that the ball is on and then leave the, the far um, full back out of the equation. Or ask your centre backs to step into midfield a bit more and, and be more comfortable on the ball. Yeah, exactly. And to kind of take responsibility and maybe just have the midfielders as screening players rather than, you know, picking up the forwards or the number 10 in particular when she drops in, that should be, uh, it should be allowed kind of stepping in. That is something they did a little bit in terms of asking the centre backs to take a bit more responsibility last night and it was noticeable the difference that it gave us in terms of the freedom. Um, Eileen Gleeson mentioned it post-match and so did Caitlin Hayes that at half time she went to the centre backs and said to them, can you pull yourselves up a little bit more because we need that support in midfield and it's something that we didn't do against France really and you did notice the difference last night when we did it against England yeah I think so and then you know by that by pushing up it means just the gaps between the um, lines are smaller than as well which does make it easier to kind of cover that ground but um, also I just the, the size of the pitch last night in the Aviva I was looking at it I, I don't know if it's an option you know whether we can try look at pulling in those pitches because um, it's definitely something we did in the past depending on our opposition we'd narrow the pitch um, which obviously makes it a lot easier if you've left ground to cover, you know, when you're chasing the game. But um, that's probably a debate for another day. So. Keith Tracy's saying, let the grass grow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it's definitely definitely worth investigating. It's obviously um, smaller distance from sideline for your throw into the goal as well, you know. So that would just uh, add add rocket fuel to that. But the, the Denise O'Sullivan thing is going to be very interesting because, like, we were kind of talking about it on the yesterday morning show. Just that type of player when you go from League B to League A, was probably going to be the one that struggles. Fewer, way, way less possession and uh, obviously way less control of the game. Like, is there a different role or is there a sort of some sort of, sort of hybrid that would allow Denise O'Sullivan to get into the game? Because obviously the playmaker that she is, 
it's just going to be very, very hard to see that manifesting itself in Cara Rowe, that's for sure, and probably in the home fixture against France. Maybe at home for Sweden she gets a bit more ball, but it's it's not looking great for uh, a creative midfield type in this Ireland team in Ligue A at the moment. No, exactly. It's um, yeah, it's difficult. Uh, we do have to. I think it kind of is vital. Like um, she's such a vital cog in the in our transition to attack, and and that you know that we do need to find a way of getting her the ball. She, I suppose, she plays as a six now, like in that whole mid spot with North Carolina too. But they they have, I think, they probably maybe have a bit more attack in our creative, more attack creative players than we probably do with the, the Irish team. So. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of trying to find ways, but I think that comes down to the opposition's tactics too as well. You know, with so many games now, but analyze in such detail, like they'll clearly see that that herself and Katie are are the main threats, and they'll nullify them as much as possible. And um, it's just yeah, it's I suppose part of that is just our our own side and and analyzing that and how we can kind of um, find ways to to create space for her. We can actually hear from Denise Sullivan now that uh, conversation with Kathleen post match. Denise, how are you feeling after that? Exhausted. <laughs> Caitlin said the same thing. Yeah, it was an absolute shift and yeah, obviously disappointed um, not to come away with any points from two of the games, but it's, uh, this is the level that we're at now and um, we have to stay positive. We had a go at them, but um, I think having without the ball for 90 minutes is uh, mentally tiring, but we'll keep pushing on and... Um, yeah, we have a camp and a quick turnaround in a few weeks. Mm. Talk us through your feelings on the pitch, because as we were just discussing with Caitlin, you know, that first half, it did feel like they were giving us the run around, but in the second half, it was a totally different story. What was it like for you? Yeah, in, in the first half, you're right. Um, I think we were too deep and went in a half time and Eileen, the staff, told us to push on. And I think we do. We tend to do that in second halves where we, we have a right go at them and we created a few chances. but. Um, yeah, I, I didn't see much of the ball in the second half either, to be quite honest. Um, so yeah, frustrating game for me, but just gotta gotta keep going and gotta get back to my club and play another game on Saturday. So it's just non-stop go, but um, we'll come back in and we'll look forward to this weekend games. It is really non-stop. Like it was an intense game on, against France on Monday, and even more intense, I would probably say, out there today. And you said it was mentally quite difficult as a squad. How do you adjust to that? Because three goals conceded isn't the worst considering some of the opposition that we're up against even though I know we don't like thinking of it that way yeah 100% look there's other teams where they scored five, five or six against so um, credit to our, our defenders they were they're excellent and they've always been brilliant for us but yeah we just have to get together again as a squad in a few weeks and um, just take the positives into the next games that's all we can do and try and try and stay positive ourselves and um, hopefully try to get points on the board in the next few games. Is it a good thing that the camp isn't that far away the next one because it means that there's not that much time to dwell on what happened and a chance and an opportunity for the team to get together again and kind of rebuild again? I think so, yeah. We absolutely love being together, this team, and look, we're all excited to come back in the next camp as well, and I'm I'm glad it's only a few weeks away because, um, yeah, as you said, we, do, we can't dwell in it, but we'd have to come back in and get straight to work again and, um, yeah, just keep this campaign going. Yeah, so that's it. It's like uh, obviously very disappointed, but at the same time, you know, you are realistic. You're up against one of the best teams in the world, one of the most well-resourced teams. The challenge now is to make sure that they they clearly learn from this, and uh, it doesn't take the halftime adjustments for them to push up the next time. That's it exactly. I I think it's if we can learn something from each of these six games, then hopefully by the time the playoffs come around, you know, we'd be in a really good position to just dominate those and, and get to the Euros, and then. In obviously looking a bit ahead but then these games are the kind of opposition we'll be facing in the if we do get to the Euros would be um, in the group stages even so it's um, it is vital I think we keep learning and I think yeah I think just the conceding early as well is probably something that they look to eradicate too It's it's kind of mad isn't it the sort of bizarre nature of how much they'll need to change from game to game or from set of games to set of games so the playoff opponents obviously going to be of a much lower standard. It'll be much like League B again when a different style of play was required and rewarded. Whereas they're kind of struggling naturally with the transition to being without the ball a lot more and being the sort of classic Irish in your face sort of thing as opposed to being uh, just, I guess, nice a nice team to watch in the eye, traditionally speaking. 
I do wonder, like, will they have an opportunity to set up a couple of friendlies before that playoff? Like, yeah, just to get back into the rhythm of playing teams of that standard because it just feels like worlds apart the the, the styles of play that Ireland need to uh, use in, in the sorts of fixtures that they have. Completely, yeah. Like, polar ops are really, and even in terms of the personnel you'd be looking to use, like, you'd want your attacking players more so, um, you know, girls who are good in the ball and good in possession rather than defenders when you are playing against those teams. And even, I think, the playoff, the first... Um, round would be against um, I think a League C team so yeah. you know again it's just a lower, lower standard again which just requires completely different game plan different like said tactics and all that so as good as these games are in terms of I suppose progressing us it, it, like you said it is completely different than game that you're going to be playing so yeah I mean I'd expect they to have friendlies like it doesn't seem like they're leaving any um, stone tur- turned these days but it's just whether you know the time frame allows it if there's the, the gap in the window to arrange those friendlies which I'd hope there will be I think there should be um, but as well I don't I think we have actually learned quite a lot from even the last two games. Um, I think that the way the team attacked last night was very different to on the how much on the back foot we were in France. And I don't think it's a bad thing if even if we do go straight off Ligue into the qualifying rounds because if we go out on the pitch and all of a sudden we're able to blitz teams and score five, six goals against someone in our playoff qualification process that's going to be pretty good for the team going down the line. The one thing you'd want is that the the psychological impact of chasing shadows isn't <clears throat> too much and they're so very, very depressed there. It felt a little... I actually I felt... Aftermath, but. T- talking to her last night felt very similar to talking to her after we knew we weren't going to progress in the World Cup. It was almost that levels of devastation. Maybe not quite that, but it was close to it talking to her last night. And I was quite surprised because... By all accounts, I thought it was a pretty good result for the two games. You know, only conceding three goals, which will be important in the playoff process because goal difference and all that sort of yeah. stuff can come into it. Yeah. So keeping scores down is really important. Oh, no, us. totally. And also for their own psychological, the the um, no punishment beatings. Yeah. And also she didn't have those two warm-up games and that was the first camp that she's ever missed against Italy and Wales. So she's coming into this fresh off the back of being like, Really eager to get yeah. back into camp. Classic Denise O'Sullivan does not like missing out on anything, is an uber, uber competitive person. And I'd say there was probably part of her disappointment there was in her own performance and not being able to get into the game and not being able to influence the game as much as it actually is well, the result. If you remember back to the World Cup, we kind of made an excuse that she was carrying an injury and had just made it and, and that that was the reason for her performances. Now there's two back to back performances where she's like, actually, I need to step up a level myself as well. So, mm-hmm. um, fingers crossed she goes away and every time she's been faced with one of those challenges before in her career, she's come back with it and and has answered it. If anyone was to do it, I think you would bank your house on Denise O'Sullivan being able to pull a performance up. Um, and also, as Owen was asking, I think we also need to try and develop a system and a style of play that does include her a little bit more because she does get really lost in that midfield for the type of player that she is and we don't have the support players and I do think she has that not a hidden role but maybe a role you don't notice as much in the support to Katie where when she wasn't there for the Italy and Wales game you noticed the amount of work Katie was doing on the ball was a lot more than usual and Denise has that effect of being able to pull players out of consideration so while she might not be on the ball necessarily and you're not watching her do tricks and turns she is fulfilling quite an important role in that team that is missed when it's not there so it's it's a juggling role it's a bit like Megan Campbell like when she wasn't there we were like oh we're getting on fine and then she comes back and she brings her free throws and she lets Katie play up higher and we're like oh we better at the World Cup <laughs> everything is everything in terms of I just out. ask one last question so uh, obviously Sweden doubleheader next up like I think there's been a, a real tone of forgiveness naturally for the, the last two results I mean like last night is in, in men's football, that's who's the number two team in the world. I can't even know, but I know Austria twenty fifth in, in in men's football. If they were beaten by France, who I think are number two, two nil, uh, you'd be like, okay, fair enough. So I think it's been kind of par for the course. Does the way we qualify for the last World Cup change the context around Sweden? Getting going to Gothenburg, getting to draw. I know they lost one nil in Tala against Sweden in the qualification campaign, but it didn't feel that Ireland were that far behind Sweden at that point. 
is that going to colour how things are going to be spoken about and how this team is going to be judged on the back of the Sweden games because there might be an expectation to actually get something now from one of these games? Yeah, I think so. I think that's kind of credit to the girls that they've put themselves in that position that now we are almost expecting um, a result or, or two against Sweden, even though they're, I think, fifth in the world, you know. If, and they've been incredibly sticky in the last two games. Yeah, like... Um, you know, realistically, again, it's uh, you wouldn't um, on paper, I suppose, we're not expected to get the points. But because of, like you said, the kind of history between the teams and the fact that we have played the World Cup and now they are the they would be the third in the group, third season in the group. It's kind of, I think people are we sense that maybe this is the one. This this is where we can kind of um, hopefully push on and get a point. And I think it would be great just to kind of round off, you know, the, the six um, games just by, by getting at least something, you know, obviously the, the performances are good, but the, the moral victories, you know, they, they do get draining after a while. So, yeah, hopefully we can can put it all together and, and get something out of the Sweden games. All right, Maeve, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. 27 minutes past eight. Uh, reminder, Braeburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of Off The Ball. <clears throat> Beat the commute with Braeburn, offering you dairy and oat options alongside a team of tasty treats. It's the perfect pit stop on your journey. To find your nearest Braeburn coffee, visit applegreenstores.com forward slash Braeburn. Up next, talking football with Jonathan Wilson. Uh, first, the final post-match reaction from last night with Cathy in conversation with Kira Carusa. Yeah, I mean, there is um, a confidence, obviously, a presence. That's right off the bat. I mean, I, I remember playing against Leah in Champions League and she's, you know, still the same player. Very calm, cool on the ball. Lovely long switch of a ball as well. Um... But yeah, that being said, though, like again, these like a player is not going out to have a perfect game as well, and there are moments and there are, there are pieces of of each of those the backlines game that we we were like, hey, like let's put them in these situations, let's put them under pressure in these ways. Um, but again, you have to respect it too. Like they they're playing, um, they're they're a class team. They're you know are European champions. So 